Hey there viewers and welcome back to the South Main Auto Channel. So we got this Jeep Liberty here. It arrived on a trailer as Jeeps sometimes do. Uh, so this one came from another local shop and uh, the guy purchased this at an auction. Now, I don't know if he bought it not running or bought it broke. Sometimes they will and you know fix them up and you know make some money on it. Uh, at any rate it doesn't run but it did. And what I mean by that is he brought it here, not running on a trailer, went out to see what it sounded like before he left, so I kind of get an idea. And it started when he was here, but you had to keep your foot like right on the floor to keep it running, and it was misfiring super bad, reeked like gas. So I just had him, you know, that's run, you know, just you know, park it over there. So he left it. It sat for a few days. I went out thinking, you know, I'm gonna have to push it in. Reached in, hit the key, didn't touch the gas, and it started. It sounded terrible. A lot of mechanical engine noise. Couldn't really tell what side of the engine, a lot of clicking, clanking, banging going on. Uh, so I just pulled it in while it still ran, plugged in a scan tool, was able to just get a minute's worth of data, seeing it was misfiring on cylinders five and six, if I remember correctly. And then it made a couple click clicks and a big bang and Joe's over, it doesn't run anymore. Of course, I you know didn't sit there and grind on a starter for 20 minutes trying to make it run, but it doesn't start easily, we'll say. Before we go inside and crank it, a few observations I will make just the visual inspection is it does have a new throttle body on it, which he told me that he had replaced. He also said he had the intake manifold off. I don't remember why. Uh, I guess that's really not important, but you know, there's evidence of that too because you can see, you know, the screw kind of wedged into the map sensor there, kind of half hanging around. Uh, perhaps it was forgotten and then, you know, you can't get to it now. So I don't know. Uh, so that's a couple things I see. Uh, right off hand other than that I guess everything looks normal we'll go have a little crank I'll show you guys what it sounds like so one observation I just noticed I didn't notice this before but we do have a thrash uh, yeah thrashing a flashing throttle light up there in the corner it's got about a buck 40 on it no idea if it's the original engine we'll crank it over and have a listen Shut off with the key out of it. <laughs> so yeah, we have a few issues. It doesn't sound good, whatever it is, I'll tell you that much. So that's only the second time I've heard the vehicle run. Now while it was cranking there, I will admit, I did touch my foot on the throttle because it sounded like it wanted to start, but it doesn't sound like it wanted to stay running. It sounded like it wanted to explode. I figured, oh, and it just, it reeks like gas. I have a hose hooked to the exhaust. It must have blew it off, but it reeks like gas. Uh, we'll let this do a auto ID. And uh, we'll see what kind of codes are in it. I don't recall checking codes last time because, like I said, I just wanted to see who was misfiring. Whew. I mean, it smells like I just dumped gas straight out onto my floor. Oh, it's an 08. What did I tell you guys? It was a 10. I thought it was a 10. 8. Whatever. Potatoes, potatoes. Let's see, we'll diagnose. Control unit. We'll just skip right to the engine. Typically, we would pull codes out of all modules. You know, mod modules can be little tattletales. They'll tell on each other. However, I think we're going to have some mechanical problems besides whatever. You know, this is going to tell us. Oh, man. Throttle position one high, throttle position two high, multi cylinder misfire. Battery voltage low, transmission range rationality, electronic throttle control, force limited RPM, unable to close throttle, Psh. ignition coil six, insufficient ionization, <laughs> uh, whatever. This is not what's making it run like crap. This is stuff we have to keep in mind. Um, you know, because you guys heard the noise. It's got a hard, hard misfire. I don't know if this has misfire data in there or not. Come on, Altel. You can do it. I'm just going to see if we have misfire data. See, just in case it starts again, we can get an idea who's who's having a hard time here. 
Lots of data. That's all training data. Oh, we got nothing here. Maybe under special functions. I'll find it. It'll be on here somewhere. Should be. Right, so I switch scan tools here. So I think, I mean, this should have misfire data on it, but I know the all tell and Chrysler misfire data has always been super sketchy. So we'll see. Just this way here, if it, uh, if it starts again, we'll be good to go. Let's see. Let's go through here and select these. That's all we want. Okay, I don't know what's going to happen when we crank it. This may not go well. Cover your ears. Oh, she wanted to run. That may have been our only shot. Oh yeah, it's not going to be happy with me when we do this. Hmm. I tell you what, let's just uh. Come on, little fella. Nah, you know what, I'm not going to sit here and just burn this starter out. Fact is, it doesn't sound good. So here's my next approach. Uh, I'm going to do a relative compression test on it just to gather some data. I threw our amp clamp on it. Now I went ahead and yanked the fuse out of the fuel pump. Now that little guy lived right back here. I believe it was number K25 it said. Yeah, K25 fuel pump. So I pulled that out. Cranked it over a little bit to let it, you know, bleed the bleed the fuel remaining in the rail out of it, so we don't have it, you know, trying to start on us. Uh, pushed the Schrader valve in on the fuel rail, no fuel came out, so I thought that was good. Uh, cranked it just a little bit more, and it just keeps, you know, I'm just beating up against the starter, and it just sounds horrid. So I unplugged all of the coils. Uh, so hopefully we can get a good crank on it now and you know set us up a trigger i just took and back probed uh you know a light bulb in here to simulate a coil now this is much lower amperage than what the coil draws but we just want a trigger and i you know front probed it and have it hooked to our second channel on our pico so we can see you know our current trace we have a trigger that way if we see an anomaly we at least know where it's falling in the firing order okay let's see get the uh, amp clamp set up here to that zeroed out We'll start a fresh screen. Now the blue trace is our amp clamp. I've got that on a 500 amp uh, scale. And then our red trace is gonna be our coil trigger. Now cranking, I expect that to be around 12 volts and then just, you know, pull to the ground essentially every time the coil would have turned on or turned on the primary side. So let's go ahead and uh, crank it over here. point the cylinder that we're in is drawing more starter current than the rest of them okay so we got what, one two three four five six we have six events the cylinder that we're in like I said the timing appears that the spark timing is is correct coil turns on coil turns off just a smidge before top dead center all right. I haven't seen this before. I haven't seen this uh, waveform gathered. All right, well, let's figure out our next step. So that's pretty interesting to look at that. Uh, Got to think what, you know, what's going to make that draw more current than um, than the other cylinders, you know, and, you know, I know that that one's excessively high as opposed to being the other ones being low because it's drawing like three, 300 amps, you know, and these starters don't, 
typically draw 300 amps. You know, we have uh, normal, let's say, you know, look at the other ones, they're around, you know, 180s, you know, somewhere in there. You know, that, that's, that's doable. But, you know, this thing certainly isn't going to pump out 300 amps per cylinder. Well, let me get the fire in order, kind of get some more data. Sometimes I like to just pause and ponder. So we'll come over to the magic board. Uh, one, six, five, four, three, two. That was our firing order. So my theory is, so I guess I thought, you know, based on what we see, so the engine sounds like garbage. You know, when it does start, it's a lot of clanking, a lot of banging, going around. Uh, experience has to kick in at some point. Experience tells me three sevens, four sevens are notorious to send your cam followers flying. People don't change oil in them. Lifters get plugged up, they stick down, cam flower leaves down. You could go in there willy-nilly, based on a big fat guess, pull the valve covers off, have a look. I want to gather some data. I like gathering data like this because, you know, some cars, if stuff's more inaccessible, it's nice to get, you know, known good, known bads, you know, whatever. So here's what I'm thinking. Uh, 165432, we will do, I'll find their companion cylinders. And what that means is, you know, when number one's top dead center on compression, you know, firing event number four is coming top dead center of exhaust, you know, same with six. Or vice versa, when four is firing, number three is on exhaust. You know, when it's coming up on that compression stroke, this one's pushing out, you know, exhaust, this one's compressing a mixture. Um, our cylinder layout, I don't know if it means anything, one, three, five, and then two, four, six. So this is the engine, that's the cylinder layout on it. What I need to do is kind of draw us, because I don't know how to project it up here on the board, we'll draw us our uh, diagram here. So we'll do one, and then six, and five, and four, and then three. Of course, this is over-exaggerated, and then two. Okay, so this is, <laughs> that's my waveform. All right, everybody's sticking with me. So this is cylinder one, six, Five, four, three, and two. Now, in order to make those two cylinders, assuming, let's uh, so just make an assumption here that because of the current draw that, you know, six, five, four, and two are putting out seem to be normal, you know, what normal compression would be, you know, in the case of starter current versus compression. I'm thinking that number one and number three could have higher relative compression, higher starter current draw because they're doing twice the work. Are you following along? So let's say if number one is going up on a compression stroke and number four is supposed to be going up on the exhaust stroke, so we have two pistons traveling up in the engine, what if number four exhaust valve is an opening? You know what I mean? What's, what's the number one current draw going to look like? Uh, you know, so that, that's what I'm, that's what I'm guessing here. So yeah, I hope you guys see where I'm going with this. So like I say, number one and number four, both pistons are going up at the same time. Number four should just be, you know, blowing exhaust gas out through the valve. However, let's say it wasn't. Would the number one current draw look like this? Would it be twice, you know, twice the work of the starter to push that piston up? My gut tells me yes. Um, and same for number three. So let's see number three. Number three is going up on the power stroke. And let's assume number six doesn't open its exhaust valve. We're going to do the same thing here. Okay. All right. I hope I'm not using too many word whiskers and saying okay a lot, but it is getting late. So that's, that's my theory. Now let's assume that's, you know, a good, good theory. Let's assume it is. Does it, will it, would it make sense with the rest of the graph? Uh, so we are saying that number four, Exhaust valve number, yeah, EXH and number six, or let's see, yeah, three, number six exhaust valve. Let's say they do not function, so they don't open. Assume they don't. What would happen to their waveform during their compression stroke? The cylinder goes down, pulls in a big fat gulp of air, comes up and compresses it you know, drag cylinder back down. Essentially, you know, and that's assuming, let's say, you know, it's number six, for example, 
Uh, that's assuming that the number three exhaust valve isn't stuck shut. Otherwise, I think we'd have some double, double humps here. But if the exhaust valve did not function during a relative compression test on that cylinder, I'm assuming this is what we'd see. We'd see just a normal waveform. However, its companion cylinder is going to be affected. Now I've really got to think about what I just said. And it did. I had to shut the camera off and think about it. So I should be, I should be correct. If four and six exhaust valves do not work, number four, number six, it will affect number cylinders one and number three and not affect the relative compression on their cylinders. That's my theory and I'm sticking to it. I feel like a real ding dong if I'm wrong. However, I've been wrong before. And it's late, so you guys can't blame me. You're fully excused from all poor decisions when it's late. I don't know how true that is. Don't hold me to that. But what we're going to do now, because technically, let's assume the, the cam follower is off, or you know, there is a problem with this exhaust valve, four and six. You know, um, we should easily be able to see that on an in-cylinder waveform because technically. You know, each time that piston travels up, you know, we should have, you know, one compression hump and then where the exhaust stroke typically is, we should have another, we should have like a double compression hump. I'm assuming, like I say, I've been, been wrong before. So we're going to pull out number four, number six here, spark plug. We're going to stick a pressure transducer in cylinder and then crank it over. See what it uh, what it looks like, and if I'm wrong, we'll just keep moving on. And I'll leave I'll leave all the wrong parts, all the mess ups in the video for you. I need some different tools. The coils are removed. I'm using my uh, magnetic spark plug socket, which is usually danger, danger. So Snap-on makes these little guys, and they're magnetic instead of having the rubber in them. However, you have to be ginger. If you cock that little guy sideways, the spark plug breaks. You know, not breaks down the head, but it breaks the porcelain. It's not very forgiving. What spark plug is? Got some NGKs in there. Kind of nasty looking. I think NGK is OEM on, on Chrysler, right? On some of these. Used to be Champion. No, I think it's NGK. I'd have to look. That really doesn't matter. But I know you guys, somebody will be like, oh, it's NGK spark plugs. They're junk. Which I'm sure we'll get that comment anyways. And I don't even know if that's what the guy talks like that says that, but. That's what that looks like because sometimes people want to see what it looks like. It is not super wet and the carbon that is on it easily seems to kind of wipe off on my digits. And I don't know, these may be brand new also. V-Power, V-Power. Oh, I have no idea what possessed me to just pull both of them out of the head. Make sure we get the right adapter here. All right, am I right? No, I'm not right. <laughs> I'm not right. I don't want the right thread, right size. We'll take and stick that on our hose. Give it a little flick that snaps it on good. Uh, we'll, we'll go for this cylinder first. This is cylinder number four. So I'm just going to thread the hose down in there. And then we'll stick our pressure transducer on it. Crank it over, see what it looks like. Then see if we can't make a call or if we're just back to where we started. Who knows? You see guys, now I'm gonna thread this other spark plug back in. Just a few threads. That way we don't have to hear it poofing while we're cranking here. Shouldn't make a huge difference, but it'll be on the safe side. I have more control experiment. 
I, I did set up a trigger on this too, so we should be able to see the firing event at the peak of the compression stroke. Uh, I've got it turned on, set on range one. We'll get our scope set up and crank it over. So our blue trace, you can see, uh, we have this right up here in the corner. We got to set WPS 500, range one, uh, 200 PSI should be plenty. Again, our trigger for the ignition coil is going to be our red trace. So I'll just take and pause this. We should have enough time on the screen. So our fresh screen. All right, we'll go crank it over. Let's see what we got. Should be enough data so we'll pause that uh, I hate not saving it before I start meddling with it so we'll zoom in look at that that's classic well it's not really classic it's not like I see it every day uh, so our red trace here is our firing event this is beautiful this is a thing of beauty right here people um, so we can see Clearly, this is exactly what we hypothesized, and now we have proof. Uh, let's see, we'll zoom in here just a little bit more. Any of you guys that have followed our channel, when we use, uh, you know, the Pico, and we've done, what way zoomed in here, and have done in-cylinder pressure tests, you know, you get kind of an idea of what they look like. Uh, so we'll look back here on the scope. We see as the cylinder comes up during its compression stroke, it, it peaks out at, what's that, you know, compression-wise, about 180 pounds, all right? So that's, that's good, that's acceptable. Uh, spark plug fires, you know, coil saturates right here. It releases, it fires a little bit for top dead center. Piston would be coming back down on its uh, compression stroke, or on its power stroke, rather. Let's just get our atmospheric pressure here. Uh, so the piston comes back down, so top dead center, bottom dead center, and then usually in this area here, it starts the exhaust stroke. Typically the exhaust valve would be open, it push the exhaust gas out, and then, you know, it hit top dead center, intake valve would open, drag itself back down, and then start the cycle over, you know, so it's just the four, the four strokes of the engine, intake, compression, power, exhaust. However, we can see here during what should be the exhaust stroke, the exhaust pressure is about 150 PSI. <laughs> so that's uh, pretty interesting. This is definitive. Without breaking this waveform down any more than what we see right now, number four cylinder exhaust valve is not functioning. Highly likely due to a bad cam follower or a missing cam follower. We know the intake valve is working, uh, you know, we're getting air into the cylinder, it's making compression. Now I'm, I'm just kind of just tossing an idea out here. You know, if we stuck a normal compression gauge on this, you know, let's say this came into your shop, uh, you know, you're just going through doing compression, your compression gauge would have popped up to 180 PSI. Would you have moved on at that point or not? Uh, and this is kind of a good time to stress that, that, you know, a compression tester only tests the engine's ability to seal. It doesn't check its ability to breathe. So something to keep in mind there. You know, what would it look like if we did have it running and we could put a vacuum gauge on the intake? You know, I don't know. But here's what we do know. So we're going to keep trucking. We're going to pop into the number six cylinder, which is the other one that we drew on our board that we suspect is also bad, likely in the same way. Before we get real far here, I just want to show you guys this. I threw some rulers up on here so we can see. Let me just shrink this down. Oops. Easy fella. We can see our, so zero degrees here, top dead center, bottom dead center, top dead center, you know, bottom, and then top again. We can see that this area right here is the exact moment in which the intake valve opens. And that's when that cylinder decharges, so to speak, uh, you know, cause it's again, you know, compressed, you know, cylinders dragged back down it's pushed back up during the time that the exhaust valve should be open, but it's not. So it's just compressing. And then somewhere's right around, you know, this area, we'll say right through here, that intake valve is opening and all of that compression is released back into the intake. You know, you know and that's probably why we're getting that, you know, that popping sound that we hear when we crank it. We hear it, I don't know if you guys could hear it, but I could hear some kind of odd, you know, 
you know, every time it was cranking over, and that would make sense. You know, we've got 100 and, you know, whatever pounds, 148, 150 pounds of compression, and now all of a sudden the intake valve opens and, you know, right back into the intake. So that's pretty neat. Uh, and that's, a, again, another little bit of proof to know, like, yes, the intake valve on that cylinder is working. I've gone ahead and moved, uh, moved the pressure transducer back to the number six cylinder. I'm pretty suspicious we're going to see the same thing. We'll get the scope rolling here. I did save that file. I'm going to try to put all these files in the link below so you guys can look at them too. Of course, you got to download the Pico software first, absolutely free, but then you can view them files and, you know, you can, it's essentially you have the full Pico right there in front of you. All right, so let's get this recording and we'll crank it. Bambino. Looks like the same stinking waveform we just took off the other side. Exactly the same thing. Uh, compression on this cylinder is what, 167, so that I think it's a little bit lower on the other side, but totally not worried about it. At this point, based on, you know, this here, this waveform here, our, coil, our ignition coil firing event appears to be about the right time. You know, we don't even have to pull up cursors. We can see, you know, compression, again, top dead center, intake valve opens, relieves all that pressure, you know, draws air back into the cylinder and, you know, starts the cycle over. Based on that and on our relative compression waveform and only seeing two excessively high peaks, excessive current draw on those, I don't really have any need, or I don't have any suspicions of the driver's side bank. Now, there could be more problems with this engine, absolutely. Uh, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, there definitely can be, could be, you know, like I said, this thing's an auction car. We don't know. We don't know how it ran before anything. But we do know is that we have two cylinders on this bank that have non-functioning exhaust valves. Exhaust valves are stuck shut, likely because of a bad, you know, cam fire top. What I would suggest to the customer at this point is, you know, here's what we know. There's no sense in really going any further to do any more diagnosing, you know, doing leak downs and everything like that. What I would do is I'd pull that valve cover off and see what kind of damage is there. You know, it could be, I mean, this thing could be freaking nuked. You know, we have no idea. Hopefully the cam flowers are just laying under the cover. Again, we don't know. You know, who knows? I mean, the valve top stem is bent over. We don't know. At this point, I would feel more comfortable just stopping, making a call saying, let's pull that valve cover and then take it from there, see what we see. We pull that off and we see the cams all chewed to pieces, then, you know, forget about it. You know, it's gonna need an engine at that point or whatever he wants to do, so. I'd say it's time to make the call.